Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, we're going to have a panel discussion on the question, should um, puberty blockers ever be used for gender dysphoric children? And I'm very keen to hear different uh, views on this. And then after that, we will have a Q&A for, for the panel. So you will make sure you get a chance to get your questions. Um, so I'm going to start off with the, the question of the day. I'll start with you, Michael, then over to Ken and then over to Malcolm. So number one, do you think, set your position out, do you think puberty blockers should ever be used for gender dysphoric children? And if not, why not? And what, so like a leisurely answer. And what <coughs> should we do instead, if you follow me? Uh, yeah, no, thanks. Um, I think that given the fact that these are widely used um, in many clinics and given the fact that they are available um, from uh, outside the recognized health system. So, of course, we have a in the United Kingdom, we have Gender GP, which is an, uh, a company which is registered in Singapore, uh, run by the Webberleys, which gives out puberty blockers. And, you know, you were outside the NHS. I think it is, we have to recognize uh, the the fact that you know there is a big demand for this, and I think that they they can they should be given as part of a randomized clinical trial. So part of I mean of course it's going to be hard to have a compliance, particularly if they're if they if they can have an out outcome. But I think if you have an alternative way of getting them, but I think to the NHS or the you know, public health system should say. You can take part in a randomized clinical trial. There's a 50% chance you'll get them, 50% chance you won't, and then we follow up and see what the, you know, what the differences are between those who were given them and what those who weren't given them. So in other words, not doing what Sir De Vries said, saying it's unethical to have this randomized clinical trial, but actually have a randomized clinical trial. And to say that, that you know, that's the only way that we, you know, we will be giving them as part of, of a kind of public health system. And does that mean every child at a gender clinic will be invited to be part of a randomised clinical trial? Well, that those, those children who would not, you know, under current rules, would have been given puberty blockers would okay. then go into the trial instead, yeah. And is there anything else you would give to the children who wouldn't get gender just? wouldn't get puberty blockers. Well, I think both, both, both those and, both, you know, both, I mean, I suppose you could have a third treatment arm. Yeah. Um, you could have a third treatment, but I suppose there should be therapy on, for both. I mean, there should be therapy for both the kids who get the puberty blockers and, the, and who don't get puberty blockers. Okay, thank you. And Ken, what do you think? You have to get quite close to it. Yep. Um, is this working? Yeah. Okay. So, a few thoughts, Stella. Um, so, first of all, um, if you think about it historically, uh, your question reminds me uh, of an article that was published in Acta Psychiatrica Scandinavica in 1961 about <laughs> adults with gender dysphoria. And at the time, they used the word transvestitism. But, and they wrote, transvestitism resists psychiatric treatment. And in a way, that is one historical reason why physical treatments were endorsed by psychiatry and psychology because the argument back then was, well, even if the client or patient wanted to lose their gender dysphoria via psychotherapy or whatever, nothing seems to work. So in a way, the, the medical treatments were the best alternative that we can offer you. Now, moving on, um, <clears throat> we first began in Toronto to use uh, hormonal suppression for some cases in 1999, uh, following what the Dutch were writing, and you know, we recommended it in about 60% of the adolescents we were seeing, which is very similar to what the Dutch reported in their early studies, actually. Now, you could ask, well, why did you guys recommend blockers back then? So you can ask that, and now I'll answer it. Um, if you remember my slide, you know, we didn't see that many adolescents back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I would say that 
the clinical perspective that our team had, which was led by the child psychiatrist Sue Bradley, was that the adolescents we were seeing back then were pretty locked in and consolidated in their gender identity. Uh, and we didn't see any evidence that they were going to respond to psychotherapy even if they wanted it. Of course, they had many other mental health issues which we would help them with or refer them out, but it was like, this is the best we can do for these kids in terms of alleviating their distress. Now, if uh, I accelerate it up to 2023, uh, my answer in my own clinical work is yes for some kids, but um, I've been thinking about what my identity is uh, in relation to this conference and other things, and I came across something on Twitter which I decided sounded good, which is that I'm a radical centrist <laughs> um, because I really don't like the left and I don't really like the right. So radical centrist seems like a good fit for me in that I don't think one size fits all. And I think that maybe a difference in my own approach and what happens in some clinics where, or, or with some private practitioners, where we know a 15-year-old can walk in the door and after 10 minutes or 20 minutes leave with a prescription for tea or estrogen. And I'm totally opposed to that clinically, that I think that one has to do a comprehensive assessment and then really explore things before one making a definitive decision about what is the best way to help a youth who has gender dysphoria. Because I think my argument is, isn't that everyone's goal to reduce gender dysphoria because it causes suffering. And as the clinician, we have to decide what do we think might be most helpful. Very good. How's that for avoiding your <laughs> question? <laughs> was radically centrist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Malcolm, what do you think? Um, I have two hats on, I suppose, here. One is as a gay man and, a, and representing a gay organization. Um, and the other one is somebody who makes science documentaries and therefore for decades has been interested in the whole business of how science is done. As the, the gay hat, if you like, the pink one I'm putting on, um, I think we've got to be careful that one of the reasons we got into this pickle was that medicine was starting to be pushed by activists from trans organizations. So the last thing we want now is for gay organizations to say, you medics will do what we say, because you know that would be contradictory. Um, however, having said that, <laughs> um, I do as a gay man think, well, one of the, the first achievements, if you like, of the organized gay movement, I think it was 1973 when when Barbara Gittings and, and a group of gay activists managed to get the American Medical Association to, to demedicalize homosexuality. American psychiatry. You're right, yeah. Trust you to know better than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so I think it's just unfortunate that, you know, that was 1973 or four, and now we're, you know, however many years later, and I look at it and think, well, homosexuality from the still from the, the slides I was looking at it looked like we're back to medicalizing homosexuality so that's one concern and I think it's inevitable that the gay rights movement in it will eventually start putting some pressure on medics to say and, and I think that's valid for us but we've got to be careful not to 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 seem like we're bullying medicine because that was part of the problem as a science documentary maker I do look at it and think wait a minute I mean from the the, the stills that uh, uh, Professor Zucker showed, it looked to me like the solution to, to, to gender dysphoria was something that nature provided called puberty. Uh, and my concern is that doctors are medicalizing the solution to, to gender dysphoria. And it reminded me of a film I made about four years ago about Zika. So 
When Zika, this, this disease, this virus that spread through Brazil and was creating babies with terribly deformed heads, when it first appeared, the Brazilian government, th they knew the one thing about Zika was that it was a, uh, a disease that was spread by mosquitoes. It had never appeared in this form with deformed babies, but they rushed insecticide in. They sprayed all these areas with insecticide. Wherever there was an outcrop of babies, they poured the insecticide in. Then a whole bunch of other scientists, mainly you know, with an environmental bent, looked at the figures and said, wait a minute, there are more babies with deformed heads in the areas where the insecticide is being spread. Therefore, it's the insecticide that's causing the problems with the babies. And it seems to me that that's what medicine is doing now. It's looking at gender dysphoria and saying puberty is causing gender dysphoria, when in fact, Puberty is the solution to it, just as in Brazil. In fact, they then worked out the insecticide was not causing the problem. The insecticide was the solution. And eventually, they managed to stop the epidemic. And I don't know how medicine can move quickly to realize that the solution is in front of them, that kids need to go through puberty. And so I suppose my conclusion would be my, a, a strong preference for not giving any child puberty blockers. OK, very good. <laughs> I think you've got popular, uh, popular, <laughs> popular opinion. Well, like, can I, can I'll, I go, just, I'll go to Michael and then over to you, to you, Ken, and we'll ask that question you wanted me to ask. But first, Michael. Yeah. yeah no, I just wanted to add, which I should have said at the out, uh, also, as uh, when I say randomized clinical trial, that one of the things that involves is uh, giving patients really informed consent about what they're signing up to. And I think that is one of the the um, disturbing things that I discovered about the, for example, the Tavistock trial. When when I used freedom of information at request to discover the actual patient information sheets and the consent forms, they were much, they were much less uh, clear about the downsides than the actual research protocol. The research protocol was very honest and said, look, there are lots of possible downsides. Um, but we actually, when they told the patients, they sort of sugar, really sugarcoated that. And they, for, for example, I mean, one very tangible example, they never told the boys that actually this will make genital surgery if you want to get a vaginoplasty later, much, much difficult, much more dangerous. They never said that, <coughs> which even though that was a known effect by that, that time. Uh, so when I say randomized control trial, I mean like with, with really full informed consent. And do you think a 12-year-old can give informed consent? Well, I think that, again, I say pr from a pr pragmatic point of view, we know that they can get them from other places. We know that there are huge demand from them. So in that sense, if we, given we, we were starting out where we are, I would say the only way of, in some sense, providing evidence maybe parts negative evidence or positive evidence is to randomize control trial. Now, if we are starting out saying, oh, let's, we've got this new, 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 um, you know, this, this new drug, then that might be a different thing. But we have to, we have to recognize where we are, uh, you know, um, where we are. That's, so my, that's my pragmatic response. Got it. And Ken? Um, could I just comment on uh, Professor Biggs' idea of an RCT, which uh, it, it's an interesting one, except it would be very, very difficult, not impossible, but difficult to carry out. So for example, I have families that I see who would in no way in hell agree to be put in a treatment arm where their kid goes on blockers. They wouldn't agree to it. And the inverse, that I might see some families where the idea that their kid has to be in some alternative treatment and not go on blockers. They wouldn't agree to that. So, but that would be the condition under which the the service would provide. Uh, it's complicated now. So, I mean, maybe some families. It would be interesting to see how many would actually agree to true randomization. But another thought I had that some of the larger clinics can take advantage of is, I mean. At the EPATH meeting this week, uh, one of the psychologists at the GIDS was talking about some data, and she happened to throw out that some of the kids were on a waiting list up to four years, which to me is like ridiculous. Um, and unethical that somebody has to be on a waiting list for like four years, three years, two years. But I was thinking that there are many clinics all around now where they do have these really long waiting lists and you could collect baseline data 
at the time they're actually going on the wait list and not when they're actually seen a year later, two years later. And maybe we would have some indication of how many kids decide, well, I don't really need this. I don't need a treatment. So they would be a cool comparison group. But I think a pure RCT in this area would be really tough to do. Just before I go on to Malcolm, you asked me to ask you a question about adolescent development. I did. I don't remember it. We can go on. <laughs> That's what anybody does. Yeah, you asked me. Yeah, anyway, we'll go on. What, what do you think of randomized trials, Malcolm, as a, because as, as far as from what I can gather from from Michael, it's kind of we are in the real politic. Mm. We are where we are. And now we move from here. Mm. How do we move from here to anywhere else? It's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything to add in terms of I mean, it seems to me what um, Professor Zucker says is, is right. I mean, I don't know how you can run a randomized trial that is meaningful, and I don't believe the people who go to the Webberleys or these parents who are obsessed, um, they're just not going to take part in a randomized trial, and therefore you're not getting the full range of, of kids that would that you would be treating. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, 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 one of the, the issues I, I, I have, I suppose, is is what are we going to do? I mean, we talked about puberty blockers as if all the research looked today like it was being done in goodwill and with, with good common sense. And these were all scientists that were trying to do the right thing. Um, however, the debate is now being shaped by people at Jack Turban, you know, and some of the worst science papers I've read. And, you know, I don't know what we do about that because they, there's, there's a responsibility um, to call out characters like Turban, who it seems to me, you know, take evidence and mash it up to, to provide a really politicized uh, contribution to debate in America. And I just wondered what everybody thought about that. Uh, one specific response. Uh, when I entered uh, the PhD program at the University of Toronto in 1975, the stats professor had a sign on his desk, if you torture data long enough, they'll confess to anything. <laughs> um, and, um, but there's another point which I think is really relevant to this meeting, which is that um, the landscape has changed so dramatically with regard to the adolescents we're seeing clinically, i.e. the whole concept of rapid onset gender dysphoria. Um, as <coughs> Professor Biggs pointed out, you know, in the original Dutch protocol, one of the eligibility criteria for blockers was that there had been a long-standing history of gender dysphoria um, because the Dutch back then never saw late onset males with gender dysphoria like we did in Toronto, um, who I wouldn't call rapid onset gender dysphoria, but late onset males with co-occurring transvestic fetishism or autogynephilia. By the Dutch protocol, they would say, well, you can't use blockers because they didn't have a long standing history. But you know, now most of us, uh, the majority of adolescents we're seeing, well, l let me modify that. I think for sure many of us are seeing adolescents now who don't have the classical early onset history. And um, I think that rapid onset gender dysphoria is a new clinical phenomenon that we need to understand better. Um, there are some people who hate the concept. Um, I have some ideas why that is, but I think we have to, as clinicians and researchers, say, hey, what is going on? This is new. We've never seen this before. And what is the best way to help kids with ROGD? And 
but they are, I think, very, di and we know so little about what's going to happen to these kids, and they need to be part of all of this. Yeah. Does, uh, thank you. Does anybody have any last thoughts on this, and then we're going to open it up to the Q&A? Do you have anything? I would only say quickly one thing that I, I thought it would be good for us to talk about at some stage is that a lot of the puberty blocker research, the, the name that came up often was Van Guren <clears throat> in along with um, Pick Guren. Guren. And, and one of the things that was amazing about the, the early 90s was that work that was done by him that su su suggested that there was actually a transsexual brain and that they, they felt, they argued that this meant it, that transsexuality was based on biology. And I think that changed the debate because then people thought, oh, there's no real risk in doing puberty blockers. You're, you're, you're addressing a biological artifact. Um, but that work has never been replicated. And so this whole world of this evident, of this part of medicine is based on a proposition that has never been um, validated. Have you anything last to say on that? So uh, we'll open up to Q&A, so if you could put your hand up nice and high, and Joe will give you a mic. Maybe Yako there in the middle, yeah. Stand up there, Yako, maybe. Thank you very much. Um, this question is directed to anyone who would like to answer. Um, okay, so I'm a cl clinical psychologist, and I largely work from a psychoanalytic perspective. And in psychotherapy, we have this concept um, called, uh, there's a difference between getting better and feeling better. So many times through psychotherapy, the person might be wrestling with something and psychotherapy should be there to facilitate this exploration, this, um, this adventure of finding ways of modifying this distress, um, the <coughs> confrontation with the other. Don't you think that the medical fraternity has actually abandoned this principle of differentiating between getting better and feeling better? Well, no. Well, I'm not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> You're probably yes. best. Uh, you yeah. can answer it. Uh, I think it will. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in and think it's, it's a very good question that I'm very keen to hear, especially what Ken has to say about that. <laughs> Um, well, I think, let's say we're talking about adolescence. Um, in my clinical experience, uh, adolescents are quite variable in how interested they are in psychotherapy. Um, and also as clinicians, we have to evaluate what type of therapy would work best for an individual adolescent. So, you know, if I see a 14-year-old who comes in and says, with regard to gender dysphoria, I don't know who or what I am. Um, fine. You can enroll them in therapy, and they're really great because, you know, they are uncertain themselves about what they think is best for them. But then, you know, there are other kids where they're not particularly strong candidates uh, for any type of in-depth type of psychotherapy. So one really has to come up with a formulation in terms of what is the best way to work with a particular kid. Um, what I think is evolving for me over the last few years is how, how broad the range, in, the range is in what adolescents are open to doing. So there are some kids who say, you know, I know my parents are not going to support uh, me doing anything medically until I'm at least 18, or then that or that mysterious age of 25 when all of our brains apparently fully mature. <laughs> uh, 
And, you know, if you Except think about mine. distributions, <laughs> that, if that's the mean, you know, people like me are in trouble because <laughs> mine's still maturing. Um, and they're open to kind of sort of taking things slow. Um, and what I think that gives us the opportunity for these adolescents, despite being under so much pressure to make a decision about their identity, that they may decide, I don't need to go down this pathway. Um, in reflecting on being at the uh, EPATH meeting earlier this week, uh, one of the things I noticed, which I, I may have it wrong, but uh, usually people talk about gender affirming treatment, GAT, but I noticed some of the younger folks presenting at the meeting were using the term gender affirming medical treatment, GAMT, which was making me wonder if in that model that there is a psychological piece to it isn't there anymore. Because remember, you know, in the original Dutch model, uh, which I guess Hannah Barnes has expropriated in her book, Time to Think, in the original Dutch model, the idea was reducing distress with the somatic changes uh, of puberty would give the kids more space to kind of explore their identities. Okay, um, I think we've a question with. Just have, oh yeah, uh, Michael. Yeah, Kidd, just yeah. just uh, sort of two pragmatic considerations. I mean, first of all, in the in, in England, uh, the Tavistock, the last had uh, six thousand patients per year coming in, as well a four year waiting list. So pragmatically, intensive psychotherapy for all those children is not uh, maybe maybe logistically very difficult. Oh, the other thing is conversion okay. therapy. You know, that's now you know in many countries it's now against the law. For, for that kind of exploration, or could, you know, it's a gray area legally. And certainly in Britain, although it's not against the law yet, I mean, there's a law in process, but there is a memorandum of understanding that says that, uh, you know, psych psychotherapists and clinicians cannot attempt to convert uh, a child. And so, um, yeah, those are two pragmatic considerations. Uh, and on that issue, like, if the gender identity clinics didn't promote the concept that only gender identity specialists could treat gender dysphoria, if, if Ordinary therapists, mm. general therapists could treat mm. like they treat many different mm. issues, then there wouldn't be a four year waiting list. There would be another option. It mightn't be something that people want, but it's certainly mm. there. So those so those waiting lists are arguably f fabricated oh, yeah, on a premise. But I am very keen to get Rita Karto Kaltiala's question. Thank, thank you, Rita Kertokaltiala from Finland. I, I, I want to go a bit back. The, the name of the, the, the discussion was, uh, is it uh, ever justified to give uh, puberty blockers to children? And I just want to make a clear uh, underline that the children and adolescents are, are totally two different things. And I would like to hear your comments about, are we actually now discussing about giving puberty blockers to children who are pre-pubertal to prevent the whole puberty? or after the first stages or some stages or maybe completed physical puberty when we are treating adolescents. And in the original Dutch model, the idea was that the first stages of puberty have to go through. So if they go to Tanner stage two, it's a very early in the puberty and you can discuss whether it should be a bit longer or whatever. But anyway, the idea was that the puberty, when puberty starts, then this will very likely influence the gender identity. And now it's one of the debates that was mentioned in the lectures that, that the, how, how actually and what the influence is and whether they will desist or persist and so on, everything related to this. But it's, it's also, I think it's most important to, to, to acknowledge and keep in mind that I understand that puberty is a very essential thing for future sexuality. And if we totally prevent puberty from occurring, and, and then that's another issue, not only about what is going to be the gender identity, but if the person is ever going to be able to enjoy sexuality in any gender role. And I, th I think this also has to be, we have to be aware that there is this problem, that that needs to be discussed. So I would like to, to underline that, uh, that uh, preventing puberty altogether or, or starting blocking it after it has initiated are different things. And I would like to hear the comments of the panel on 
what exactly <laughs> and when exactly might we consider these interventions or yeah. not consider at all? Uh, it, it's a very good point. I was certainly going from the premise of under 18s, but I'm interested to know what what any of you were thinking. Well, I I, I thought the impl implicitly it was under 16, but yes, yeah. around that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought the question had to do with like ten or stage two and up, but there is actually uh, one uh, academic activist who's written a paper saying that all children should be put on blockers. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can, can I just add to that? There is now um, at least one child in Australia who is on blockers permanently. Um, and it's because after all, the logic is you can actually, you know, if puberty is a disease, you can also stop puberty from ever happening. And so you can ever, you can go through as a kind of life as a, as a sort of a prepubertal uh, um, adult. Whoa. And of course, by the time they reach 16, you can no longer, when they were told, you now you need to either go on across sex hormones <coughs> or revert. They said, now I'm, a, I'm at the age of consent, and I, I'm not consenting to anything. I would just want to be perpetually on puberty blockers. Extraordinary. Um, another question, maybe uh, Sarah over there? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, I found this really helpful. I think it's really great to kind of hear from the experts on this, but I'd be keen to know what's your view on... Um, medical. Uh, will you introduce who you are? Oh, sorry, um, my name is Sarah Holmes. So uh, um, from Dublin, from Dublin, Wicklow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I'm um, I'm curious to see what you think are the responsibilities of the medical profession and the experts in standing up to um, or getting involved in politics, where so much of the policies are being driven by activists. You know, where they have their own agenda and, you know, they want a certain outcome and it feels like it's very hard to get politicians to listen to anyone other than activists in Ireland anyway. And so basically what is, what is the responsibility as you see it of medical professionals in, you know, shaping policy at the kind of political level? Would, do you want to start, Malcolm? Uh, it's a similar, I suppose I'm answering a similar question that I hoped you'd ask. It's, 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 it overlaps. I was just going to comment really that I think the great thing about this conference is it feels like, if you like, the gender critical movement is sort of coming of age in a way and like really grappling with some of these Tanner issues. Tanner stage two. <laughs> Tanner stage two. <laughs> Don't block its puberty. Um, uh, but it... it I mean, there will, there will be difficult questions that will come up, like, for example, the question about puberty blockers. I mean, I don't know whether, um, you know, some kids that have precocious puberty, that the puberty blockers are used for them, and, and nobody, I, as far as I know, is saying... No, there is, there is a critical... There is critical, critical, there, yeah. critical. Yeah. there are issues about side effects and all the rest of it, but I don't think we have a, an immediate answer to some questions. And in a way, this is what this is all about, is, is trying to work out... I mean, the, the ideal is to bring some of the people from EPATH in here, and we can only do that by engaging with what uh, Laura yesterday, the detransitioner, said with a, with a sort of spirit of humility. That if we come across as we have all the answers and we're going to be, if you like, the, the, the other bunch of activists telling the doctors what to do, there's a lot of, there's a lot of open-minded scientists in EPATH who just are doing the wrong thing and have been sucked in and it's their profession and all the rest of it. And I think... We need to put a hand to them to say, let's have a discussion. And it has to be done in a spirit that doesn't feel like it's infused with sort of activist agenda. Very good. Uh, just to add, I think, I, mean, I think the primary responsibility of, of gender clinicians is to you know, collect and publish data, right? I mean, leaving aside sort of political policy issues. And that, I think, is one thing that is very bad, um, particularly, for example, in the Tavistock, you know, not publishing the results of this trial until I, uh, you know, in fact, it disappeared until I had, had sort of called attention to it on transgender trend and in the media, and also not carrying out follow-ups. I mean, they, they say that we, we, ne we can't trace anybody after the age of 18. You know, so that their entire, so even though it's been, it was established in the, in the 1980s, 
They've, they, they've never tracked any of their patients after the age of 18. So that is a serious failing scientific and um, clinical failure. We'll go for one more uh, question from Helena, <coughs> and then we'll have a coffee break. Thank you. Um, so as I listen to this debate... Intr introduce who you are. Oh, hi, I'm Helena Kirshner. I'm a detransitioner. I was on the panel yesterday. Um, as I listen to this debate on puberty blockers, I have respect for the concerns about treating the gender dysphoria and all of the various factors that clinicians are facing when they're considering what to do with young patients who are struggling with gender dysphoria. But I think we're lacking clarity on one very crucial question, which is, is it ever ethical to induce things like infertility, anorgasmia, osteoporosis, and other side effects that may not even be well known in a previously healthy patient? Well, I suppose, again, I'll just re repeat pragmatically, there are thousands and thousands of children who are really desperate for the and parents who are really desperate for this, and they've been told that this is, this is and they can buy it online, um, they can buy it uh, through this company like Gender GP. So you can say, well, we should no give it to nobody, but in, in fact, they will be getting it, they will just be getting it not in the, in this, in the way that data is collected, long-term outcomes of studies and so on. Mm -hmm. My, my feeling is you're anti-prohibition for practical reasons. Yeah, exactly, yes, yeah. yes. Ken? I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think morally it's unforgivable, but I don't know how we move from where we are now to, to where we would like to be. Yeah. Well, we'll break up for coffee and remi remind ourselves, like, we don't have any answers. We've got lots of questions, and that's the idea of the conference. Thank you.